So welcome to the crowdfunding webinar. This is the first time we're doing this as a webinar, and um, I'm really excited to share a lot of this information with you guys. Um, the point of the webinar is for you to learn about crowdfunding and basically how to have a successfully crowdfunded online campaign. Um, before I started, I start, I just want to tell a, a brief little story about a crowdfunding campaign that happened um, in 2009 or 2010, but it was at, at the beginning of the sort of crowdfunding um, launch for a lot of a lot of people. People were not familiar with crowdfunding, and a friend of mine sent me a Kickstarter campaign that they were fundraising for. It was called Carrier Pigeon, and Carrier Pigeon is a print magazine of illustration and fiction stories. And they were fundraising for the um, the first issue that they would let, they wanted to publish. It was a group of about eight people that got together and decided they were going to make this magazine. So they sent out this Kickstarter campaign, and their goal was to raise ten thousand dollars in three weeks. And so, you know, I'd been working in fundraising for a number of years at this point when I got the the ask, and I thought oh my God, no way are they going to be able to raise $10,000 in three weeks. And so I contributed and I started getting updates. And I was getting these sort of almost every other day updates telling me, you know, they've raised $2,000. Somebody was just given a free print based on, a, on one of the perks that they gave. Um, I started getting emails saying how, many, how much time they had left. And all of a sudden, they had 10 days left, and they had only raised slightly over $5,000. And I really thought, there is no way that they're going to reach their goal. And as we'll talk about in a little bit, with Kickstarter, if you don't reach your goal, you don't get any of the money. So I was just watching it and thinking, this is awful. They've already, they can't get this $5,000. So... Anyway, about five days before the end of the campaign, they only had slightly over $6,000. And they decided to kind of host this sort of spur of the moment event. And at the event, they were giving away, you know, prizes for people that um, contributed. And they, in one night, pushed themselves over the $10,000 mark. And it was just kind of this amazing thing to see it happen. And I think it was directly related to the campaign. And it was this also surprise element where I think all of the people that had contributed to that point were, you know, they wanted to contribute more. And so they went to the event, they attended, they participated. And I just, I like to use that as an example because it's, it was something that when I saw it, I thought, no way, this is, they're never going to be able to do this. They're too small. They don't know enough people. And then they really turned it around and kind of put themselves out there and started going crazy fundraising. And it, it worked. So um, they've now printed two magazine issues and they're beautiful. Um, you should check them out. Carrier Pigeon. They're in a lot of stores. Um, so just to get started, um, briefly what we're going to talk about is we're going to just talk really briefly about what fiscal sponsorship is and what crowdfunding are. Um, this is not a presentation on fiscal sponsorship, so it'll be very brief about fiscal sponsorship. We're going to then just go over the, um, a few of the leading crowdfunding platforms. I'm going to talk about the keys to crowdfunding success and the benefits of crowdfunding. We're going to talk about audience building and some of the myths that are surrounding crowdfunding. Before I begin, um, it's nice to meet you guys, even though it's more me talking and you guys listening. But um, in case you're not familiar with Fractured Atlas, Fractured Atlas is a nonprofit art service organization. Our mission is to help artists with the business side of their work. We do this through a variety of different programs and services. To start off with, we're a member-based organization and we're national. We are web-based and so you can access all of our services and products online. Membership is $95 a year for an individual and $195 a year for an organization. Our programs and services kind of um, range pretty broadly. We have a low-cost liability insurance program 
The liability insurance program are some, is, will give you access to some of the lowest rates in the country for any type of liability insurance policy that you might possibly need. So that could be you need to get a camera insured or you need to insure a space that you're renting or you're starting a board of directors and you need to get officers um, and directors insurance. You name it, we'll be able to find it for you. We also have a health insurance program. The health insurance program is mainly focused on advocacy and education. What we do with the health insurance program is try to provide you with any sort of tools that you might need in order to find health insurance options that are right for you. We have a licensed health insurance broker on staff who knows a ton about navigating the health insurance world. So if you have questions or you need help, please don't be afraid to contact us because Marie um, Ortiz, who is our director of healthcare, knows a ton of information and can definitely help you figure out what are the best options for you. We have a professional development program. It's mainly an online program that consists of online classes and tutorials where you can go at your own pace. They're free and, at, um, and accessible online for you to use at any time, so you should check those out. They have, you know, sort of the basic intro to fundraising, intro to marketing, um, intro to professional identity, and sort of um, upper level classes also. We are in the process of launching a, a new program called Artfully. Artfully is a ticketing system that will allow you to sell tickets to your events. Um, it is going to be something that it's a separate website, um, and it's software that we built. So what you would be able to do is go to Artfully, create an account, and start to sell tickets through Artfully. There'll be things like widgets where you can put it on your own website, and the tickets can actually be purchased on your website using the Artfully software. So this is something we're going to be launching in the next few months. You should definitely check it out if you have any um, need to sell any tickets. Lastly. Um, I'm just going to mention the fiscal sponsorship program, and you know I'm going to talk a little bit about that, so I'm not going to say much right now. But I am the director of the fiscal sponsorship program. Um, in case you weren't on the beginning of the call, my name is Diane DiBasella. Um, I'm in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, and I've been working at Fractured Atlas for about five years. My focus is in helping um, artistic projects raise funds, and my expertise is really in individual fundraising. So what I mean by that is really tapping into the power of getting individual contributions from donors across the United States to help you fund your creative project. I also deal pretty heavily in helping our projects apply for grants, and so I do quite a bit of reviewing grant applications and talking to funders to find out what they're looking for in, an, in a grant application. Um, just above me on the right-hand side, Juliana Steele is our program specialist for fiscal sponsorship. She also gives weekly webinars and helps a lot with the program, so you could also be talking to her at any time. We have a handful of other staff members that work in fiscal sponsorship, but I'm not going to focus on that too much right now. So bear with me, if you're fiscally sponsored, you obviously already know a little bit about it. But for those of you on the call that don't, are not familiar with it, what fiscal sponsorship does is it enables a non-501c3 um, organization. So it could be an individual artist or an emerging arts organization to enter into a legal agreement with a 501c3 public charity such as Fractured Atlas. And what it does is it enables you, the artist or emerging arts organization, to use some of the benefits of Fractured Atlas's 501c3 tax-exempt status. The main perk is that you can um, then receive tax-deductible donations for your creative project. The way that it works is that the money that you're raising for your creative project comes to Fractured Atlas, and we issue a tax receipt to your donors. If you're applying for a grant that only a 501c3 is eligible to apply for, Fractured Atlas will work with you to apply for that grant. The, the grant money will then come to Fractured Atlas, 
and we will hold it in a restricted fund that's specific to the purpose of your project. Once you have any sort of expenses that you need to pay for your project, we will release the funds to you to pay for those. So that could be anything from you know, artist fees to equipment to space, you name it, we can release funds for it. So pretty much the benefit of the fiscal sponsorship program is without you having to go out and get your own 501c3 tax exempt status, you're able to raise money and solicit contributions from individuals and institutional funding agencies. So that, there's a lot of other perks that go into it, but that's all I'm going to say about fiscal sponsorship tonight. Um, it's definitely something that relates to crowdfunding. And um, through our fiscal sponsorship program, I've become really familiar with the crowdfunding lands landscape and all of the different platforms out there. So the reason that we're giving this webinar tonight is to share some of that information and to make sure that you're equipped to, to you know, access these crowdfunding platforms. Before we get a little further into the crowdfunding landscape, this is my, one of my favorite slides. If you've listened to any of the other webinars, you probably have seen this. Um, I just want to highlight one of the statistics from this National Endowment for the Arts study. If you'll notice that 31%, so this, sorry, this pie chart represents revenue, um, a breakdown of revenue of the nonprofit arts sector in the United States. And the data was taken in 2004, so obviously the numbers are probably slightly different today, but not that far off. One thing that I do want to highlight is how much money comes from individuals. So obviously the largest percentage of a budget comes from earned income, 44% comes from earned income, and 56% from contributed income. Out of that 56%, 31% comes from individuals. So that is the largest piece of contributed income represented in a nonprofit arts organization's budget. So I like to just remind people of this and to tell you to keep this in mind during your fundraising. Individuals are the place that you'll receive the most funding and they'll be able to help you really fulfill your fundraising needs. So for those of you that are not familiar with crowdfunding, um, I like to put the Wikipedia definition up here because there's a lot of different ways of explaining crowdfunding, but I think that the Wikipedia definition is um, is quite easy and explains what it is. Um, but in a, a, a nutshell, what it is, is it's the ability to use an online community to solicit pledges. It uses word of mouth and wisdom of the crowd to generate interest and donations. Um, it also, it engages donors as part of a community so that, you know, there's some sort of transparency in the fundraising that you're doing. Pretty much your donors can see who is giving and how much is being raised at any time. And that can be a really powerful thing to compel people to contribute more. There are three major players um, out there right now. And you've probably heard a little bit about all of them, but I'm just gonna briefly you know, tell you who they are, and then we're gonna go into more depth about the differences between them. Uh, Kickstarter is one of the biggest out there. They were founded by Perry Chen and Yancey Strickler. Um, Mr. Chen started thinking about starting Kickstarter back in 2002. He had um, attempted to raise $20,000 for, um, for a concert that he wanted to hold. And basically, he couldn't come up with the money himself. There was no sort of platforms out there that would allow him to raise that money. And he started thinking about ways of, um, of creatively coming up with it. Around 2005, he met Yancey Strickler, who became um, a co-founder of Kickstarter, and they decided to start shopping the concept around to see if it would work. They raised about $300,000 in seed financing from family and friends, and um, they launched Kickstarter in April of 2009. Since they launched in April of 2009, over 5,000 projects have posted um, campaigns on Kickstarter. And collectively, these, these projects have raised over $20 million, which are pretty impressive numbers. Kickstarter uh, funds, you know, sort of any kind of um, 
creative endeavor. You know, it ranges from indie filmmakers, music, journalism, um, food-related projects. They're really about creative projects. So um, just, that's just a little bit of background information about Kickstarter. Indiegogo is another crowdfunding platform. Um, it was founded by Danae Ringelman, Slava Rubin, and Eric Sch um, Schell, and they founded it in 2008. They were really um, looking at you know this from an entrepreneurial sort of perspective, where they saw this huge need that a lot of people are looking for opportunities to raise money. Um, they offer anyone with any sort of idea, whether or not it's a creative idea, a cause-related or an entrepreneurial um, related project, the ability to use their website to raise to raise funds. Rocket Hub is the last one that I just want to mention. Um, it's a grass, grassroots online crowdfunding platform. Again, they include musicians, filmmakers, photographers, theater producers, fashion designers. Um, and what their, their goal is to help you leverage the power of your family, your friends, your fans, strangers, and the Rocket Hub community um, to raise funds. They launched in January of 2010, and they were founded by Brian Meese. Jed Cohen, and Vladimir, and I don't know how to say Vladimir's last name, uh, Vuki Sevik. <laughs> they, uh, the three of them are all artists themselves. Brian's a singer and a songwriter. Jed is an actor and a producer. And Vlad is a, um, a tech thinker and a writer. So they consider themselves, you know, founded by creatives for creatives. So those are, those are the major players. Um, one of our participants mentioned that another interesting, interesting crowdfunding source for business is profounder.com, which is P-R-O-F-O-U-N-D-E-R.com. So I'm going to just focus on these three because they are the, the sort of major ones that um, are open to any sort of creative types. There are other crowdfunders out there that focus on music, or that focus on film or fashion. So we're not going to focus on those tonight since Fractured Atlas is a multidiscipline um, organization. I just want to make sure that we're covering everybody. This is an example of um, a Rocket Hub crowdfunding campaign. And as you can see, they sort of have the standard, you know, you create the, the title of your campaign. You can post an, a project description and an image or a video. On the right-hand side, you can see that there's a goal for how much they'd like to raise, and there's an amount, they, you know, the thermometer showing how much they've raised so far. Um, as you scroll down on the right-hand side, there's where the giving levels are, and the rewards are listed. Kickstarter looks similar. Um, they, they all actually look quite similar, other than the, the design element. Again, you title it, project description, video, image, goal, um, how many days are left to go, and then Indiegogo. Again, quite similar. You know, they've all had the same premise, and I think they're all doing an amazing job of helping, you know, people with it. So how do you decide which one is right for you? Um, we'll start with Kickstarter, since they're the first one on the column. Um, you know, basically, I tried to break it out by what makes them different about each other. And first to, to start with is, you know, is can you, anybody sign up? Um, do they accept all projects that are proposed to them? Kickstarter um, does not accept all projects. So when you're on their website and you click um, the Share Your Project button, they're going to ask you a couple of questions. And then within, you know, a day or two, they'll get back to you. Um, they are not screening to ta for taste, so they're not curating the work, but they do this to make sure that you're not violating their guidelines. Um, their guidelines include that they do not allow um, charity projects or causes on their website. So this means, you know, raising money, if you wanted to raise money for the Red Cross, or, um, you know, if you wanted to just use it as a general fundraising site to help somebody raise money to, um, buy some new shoes or something like that. They do allow nonprofits with creative projects to use Kickstarter. So 
Um, that's one of their guidelines. They do not fund business projects. Um, they do not fund self-help projects or as seen on TV products. They do not fund um, hiring programmers or developers to build your website or application. So those are sort of the, the criteria for not being allowed on their site. Indiegogo and Rocket Hub do not have any sort of um, exceptions. So those, those exceptions do not apply to them. They can, you know, accept any type of project onto their websites. Do these, um, do each of them provide online support? So Kickstarter has, you know, online FAQs. Indiegogo offers webinars and in-person sessions. And Rocket Hub provides some pretty in-depth support as far as customer service is concerned. They really go, I would say, above and beyond um, to make sure that you're educated on how to actually create a successful fundraising campaign, and also just to work with you during that. All or nothing. So is a campaign, is one of, is, sorry, are the pro providers all or nothing? And what I mean by that is Kickstarter, for example, um, does only allows projects to receive funds if they reach their goal. So if you, if you raise, um, if you set a fundraising goal of $5,000, and, if, and say that you're going to do that in 10 days, and you do not reach $5,000 within 10 days, and you only reach $3,000, you do not get that money. None of the credit cards will be charged that pledged the campaign, and you don't receive any of the funds. So this is you know, something that really makes Kickstarter quite different from the other platforms. Indiegogo and Rocket Hub give you all of the money that you raise. So if you only raise $1,000 in that 10 days towards your $5,000 goal, you'll get that, that $1,000. Um, all of them have access to integrate with Facebook and Twitter to give you widgets to grab and different things like that. So they're all, they all provide really great functionality as far as connecting to social media. Their fees range pretty, pretty, um, pretty broadly. So the Kickstarter fee that um, we have listed on here says it's 8 to 10%. The reason it's that high is because Kickstarter first takes a 5% administrative fee. So this is their fee that they get paid out for all of you know, the work that they do to build the site and to employ their staff and things like that. There is an additional fee, which is through Amazon. Because their, um, their money is, is managed by Amazon, um, the Amazon charges anywhere from one and a half to four, four, four and a half percent based on what kind of credit card is being charged. So, for example, an American Express card has higher fees. And these fees are passed along to the project. So, you know, keep that in mind. Although it says they charge five percent on their website, the fees are typically higher due to the Amazon account that you'll have to use in order to get the funds. If you do not reach your goal on Kickstarter, you don't have to pay anything because you don't get any of the money, so they don't charge you anything for the use of the website. Indiegogo charges 4 or 9%. So they try to incentivize you to raise more money. Um, what I mean by this is if you reach your fundraising goal, your project will only be charged 4%. If you do not reach your fundraising goal, your project will be charged 9%. On top of this, and I, I apologize for not including this in, this fee, in these fees, there are also fees from PayPal. So in reality, you could be paying upwards of 7 to 13%, depending on you know, what the exact fees are from PayPal. Rocket Hub charges 4% if you, do, if you reach your fundraising goal. And if you do not reach your fundraising goal, Rocket Hub charges 8%. There are no additional fees from Rocket Hub. They have a third-party payment system that I couldn't find the name of on their website, but I've, I've heard them say it. I just don't, it wasn't something I recognized. So I didn't want to try to fudge that. Um, Kickstarter is not a partner with the Fractured Atlas Fiscal Sponsorship Program. So we cannot help our projects get tax-deductible donations on Kickstarter. We do have a partnership with Indiegogo and with Rocket Hub. 
So the Indiegogo partnership, we've been um, we've been providing this for about a year to our sponsored projects, and you know our sponsored projects can set up a Indiegogo campaign, and their donors can receive a tax deduction for contributing on it. In the coming months, we are going to launch this a similar partnership with Rocket Hub. So you'll be able to do that also on the Rocket Hub website as a fiscally sponsored project. So, um, you know, to get started, there are a couple of things to keep in mind. You really have to come up with a game plan. And this can be incredibly important to make sure that your campaign is going to be as successful as possible. Make sure that you really, before you launch the campaign, that you sit down and, and develop a plan. You need to choose the crowdfunding platform that's right for you. You have to actually physically set up the campaign. And then you have to think about the strategy for running it. Um, somebody just asked the question, does Fractured Atlas set up PayPal account for fiscal sponsors? So for the partnership that Fractured Atlas has with Indiegogo and with Rocket Hub, we, you do not need to use PayPal for either of those or either of their, um, their third-party sort of credit card processing. All of the donations, when you opt in to use Rocket Hub or Indiegogo through Fractured Atlas, all of those donations come directly to Fractured Atlas in your fiscal sponsorship, and we charge the credit cards. So Rocket Hub and Indiegogo never receive that money. The money comes to Fractured Atlas. We charge our standard 6% administrative fee for all of those donations. So there's nothing above and beyond on that. Anytime you're opted in as a fiscally sponsored project to the Fractured Atlas Indiegogo partnership or the Fractured Atlas Rocket Hub partnership, your donations are only charged 6%. So I'm um, getting back to the presentation. So, one of the first things you'll need to think about when you're building a, a, a crowdfunding campaign is budgets. Budgets are incredibly important. You need to be realistic with it. Um, if you inflate your budget, it's only going to hurt more later. You need to always allow for 10% extra. So, you know, keep in mind that um, your budget is bound to go over in time and on budget. So try to make sure that you're being flexible and giving your, making sure that you have that extra 10% in case you need it. Try to keep the budget indie, meaning small. Um, unless you have you know, some rich relative or somebody that you know is going to absolutely really help flood your budget, um, try to be realistic about how much money you can raise and what you can actually produce it with. Keep your expenses reasonable. Um, but obviously don't compromise your quality. Figure out where you can cut anything that you don't really need um, so that you can really focus on spending money where it counts. Once you have your budget made, um, now you can figure out what your goal is. Obviously, you know, if you're, if you're making a film, you're most likely not going to fund the entire film through crowdfunding. This is pretty unlikely and doesn't happen that often. But think about which portion of the project you can fund through crowdfunding. Possibly the development, possibly the pre-production. What aspect can you make a compelling story for people to feel you know, like they want to give to it? Make sure that you're defining your project. So you really need to learn how to talk to other people about your project. Obviously, you know anybody that's looking at your campaign is not in your head, um, so you'll need, to be, you'll need to be able to really articulate your purpose and your goals. Remember that general projects don't get funded. Um, people are really looking for a specific project with deliver deliverables, and those are the type of projects that typically get funded. You need to start thinking about time frames. So any sort of project with an indefinite time frame is hard to get funded. Make sure that you have dates in mind that you can share that with people. Make sure you're thinking about why you're different. Um, there are definitely a lot of campaigns out there. So why is yours special? What makes yours different than the other ones that are out there? 
So now that you've kind of done your homework and thought about that a little bit, um, now where do you head? Make sure that you, you pick the crowdfunding site that you will use and that works for you. I mean, as, as we just went over, they, they have some basic differences, but they're also quite similar to, to each other. For some people, choosing the right crowdfunding platform is as simple as the way it looks. They like the design. Others, you know, have worked with some of the people that work there, and they really like the people that work there. It's up to you to determine which one will work for you. One of our um, participants asked 6% plus the 4 or 9% on Indiegogo. No, it's if you're using Fractured Atlas and Indiegogo in conjunction with each other, it is only 6%. There are no additional fees. So if you're interested in learning more about that, I would suggest contacting Fractured Atlas directly. So um, when you start to think about you know, the logistics, obviously, like I just said, pick the crowdfunding site. Um, set up an account. Setting up an account on any of them is so quick and so easy. Even building the campaign is really, really easy. Make sure that you're studying the payment options. So, like Scott just mentioned to everybody in the chat, don't forget to include that fee. So whether or not it's just the Fractured Atlas Fiscal Sponsorship 6% fee because you're partnering with us and Indiegogo, or you know if you're going directly to one of the sites without Fractured Atlas, factor those fees into your budget to make sure that you know what's, what realistically you're gonna be paying. Go over the terms of service or agreement. You know, this is incredibly important, no matter what kind of agreement you're getting into. But most of these crowd, these three crowdfunding websites in particular specifically state in their, their terms of service that they will never own any of your work. And this is incredibly important. If you're going to another crowdfunding platform, make sure that's in there. You never want to, you know, give up your work to somebody else. So now that you're starting to develop the content, you need to think about developing your pitch. Um, make sure that the, the description that you're writing is concise, but that it's interesting. Make it lively. Convince people that your project is worthy. Um, make sure that, and that you have somebody else to read it before you launch. Put your pitch clip up on YouTube or Vimeo. So, you know, you, I would encourage you to have a video because I think that it's a little more compelling than a still image. Images can still be great though and can tell a lot. Um, make your video inspiring, make it fun, make it motivational. Um, make sure it's short and sweet so it's sort of like a preview or a music video. A lot of times some of the best campaigns out there have videos that are just funny. They're fun to watch, they're interesting. So once you have your video picked out, you'll need to think about your timing and your goals. So set your time frame. If you're only raising you know, $5,000, perhaps a two to four week campaign is right for you. If you're thinking about raising $50,000, you might need a longer campaign. Um, don't stretch it out longer than it needs to be. You'll lose momentum that way. You really want to think about how involved and how much effort you or whoever you know you're partnering with to do the campaign is going to have to spend on it because it can be a lot of work. Set your goal. So um, remembering that you know some of the websites such as Kickstarter and there's others out there have all or nothing. So if you don't reach that goal, you're not going to get the money. So it's crucial if you're using one of those to make sure that your goal is realistic. Again, don't forget to factor that fee into the goal, because although you might reach that $5,000 goal, you know, you're going to lose anywhere from 6 to 13%, depending on who you've partnered with and which one you're using and how much you raise. Don't set up two crowdfunding campaigns. Um, it's really not going to help you. There's no reason to do that. And I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about this down the road, but it's a myth that there's angel donors out there trolling these websites looking for people to donate to. So spreading yourself thin and putting these campaigns on multiple platforms is not going to be of any benefit to you. Think about the perks that you're going to offer the donors. So 
you know, they're really the heart of the crowdfunding campaign that you're putting out there. You're asking them for money. And in exchange, you're going to give them some sort of token. Um, whether or not this is as simple as, you know, their name in the credits or providing them with an MP3 of a song that you're making, um, a copy of the CD when it's released, maybe some sort of executive producer status in the credits. Make sure that what you're offering to them is appropriate for the giving level that you've selected. Make sure that you can afford them and that this also factors into your budget. So if your perks are going to cost you some money or some time, make sure that you're not totally screwing yourself over by you know, spending all of the money on perks or mailing or whatever it is that will be required to go into it. Keep in mind that you are going to have to email or mail those perks and that you need to collect donor information. Um, getting a lot of donors is a great thing, but keep in mind that if you've decided to mail actual items, it's also postage, it's also your time and putting that stuff together. When I mentioned Carrier Pigeon, the magazine that I contributed to at the beginning, I um, I actually got a I got a T-shirt and I donated again and I got a book. I got one or one of their magazines, which are quite like a book actually. That's why I'm referring to it as that. But you know, it's funny. I I saw my friend who was part of um, Carrier Pigeon. Maybe I don't know. It must have been four to six months after the campaign. And I actually invited him to be on a panel that I had organized um, to talk about his experience using Kickstarter. And I said to him in the middle of the panel, I said, I never got my t-shirt or my magazine. Um, it took him over seven months to get them sent out. And I think I was teasing him, but obviously that is something you want to be aware of when you give to people um, that, or when people give to you, that you make sure that you perks that they didn't forget that you're actually sending this to them or they don't think that you know you drop the ball and you're not going to do it. If you need some sort of boost, oh sorry I missed one, um, average donation amounts are around $70. So this is a good thing to keep in mind when you're setting up your perks so that you know probably the majority of your donations are going to be in that range. And that's um, a number that I pulled from the Indiegogo and Kickstarter website. They've both said that you know the across the board, the average donation around hovers hovers around seventy to eighty dollars. So that perk level, obviously, you're going to have a lot of those perks that people are going to be getting. Also, think about that in terms of your budget. If you really think that you can get, you know, a hundred donors at you know seventy dollars a pop which is the average donation amount, you could raise $7,000 pretty easily. If you need a boost in the middle of your campaign and it's starting to drag and slow down, think about announcing a, a new perk for donors at a certain level. And this is you know, sort of what Carrier Pigeon did. They decided they needed to have this event because they felt like it was slowing down, people weren't giving any more money. And so they had an event where they got a space donated, they got wine donated, they had music donated, and they had people come in and they showed them artwork that was going to be in the magazine. They actually didn't give anything away. That was just, it was just this party. And it sort of pushed them beyond that little hump that they needed to get over. So don't be afraid to do that. You know, list a new perk that's something that will really captivate people and, and bring them in to um, contribute more. Keep in mind that you're probably going to only get a few heavy heavy hitter donors, um, which is you know the donors above the $500 mark. Um, make sure that their perk is extra special. You want to make sure that you know they know that you appreciate how much they're giving. And you know this is typically I see often with filmmakers they do things like they let them visit the set for a day, or you know they have a special screening for them, or something like that. Um, Keep the perks personalized and more limit, limiting as or limited as the giving levels go up. And keep in mind that your perks can set you apart. So if you can create really fun and creative perks, it's something that's going to really make your project stand out and make people remember that you know they uh, they want to be part of the project. So audience building. Um, I didn't pause for questions, but if anybody has any, please feel free to chat them in the bottom right-hand corner. 
So with audience building, obviously, um, as I just mentioned, there is no such thing as angel donors. There are no donors out there, unfortunately, trolling the internet trying to find creative projects to donate to. If there are, there's not a lot of them. Um, and there's a lot of crowdfunding campaigns out there. So the likelihood of them landing on your project randomly is, um, is slim. Sorry to be negative about it, but I, I just want to make sure that that's, you know, that's a huge myth that I try to dispel as quickly as possible because it doesn't really happen. What you do need to do and the way that you're going to get people to contribute is by emailing everyone you know. And when I say everyone, I mean everyone. So that ex-boyfriend from high school that you haven't talked to in 10 years, send him and his sister an email. Collect email addresses whenever you network so that you have access to these people. Um, obviously, the people closest to you will be the ones to donate first and will help you build that momentum. But, you know, once you start doing it and you're using, you know, some of the tools that these providers have, such as the widget tools, um, you can post it on your blog or your website. Make sure that you're listing it everywhere. If you don't have a Facebook account, you should get one. It's kind of imperative for fundraising these days to be able to have that connection to a lot of people. You'll need to be able to post the updates and to help drive people back to your campaign. Facebook is a huge, a huge place for crowdfunding to actually be successful. So, you know, that ex-boyfriend and his sister on, on Facebook, if you're connected to them and they're connected to 20 people that you went to high school with, and all of these people, you know, that you were at one time really close friends with, if all of them contribute 10 bucks, which is probably around the amount that you can expect somebody you haven't talked to in 10 years to give, it really can help to start drive up your donations. Don't forget about, you know, Twitter, MySpace, Tumblr, all of those. There are also um, the ability to automatically connect them through these platforms is built into each of them. Talk to bloggers, organizations, and other folks who are interested in your topic. So, you know, keeping in mind that if your campaign is relevant, it could end up in the local paper or it could be spread out through the blog community. Some of the most successful crowdfunding campaigns are ones that get articles written about them in the press. So if you're really looking for those angel donors and you really want to try to bank on getting some angel donors, you have to get press coverage. That's the only way they'll find you. Make sure that you're keeping your content current. So post regular updates so that they can be shared. And this can be as simple as you know, putting those updates out there hey, we've raised, we've raised $3,333. Yay! We have 10 days left to go. Check out this new perk. We have 15 hours left. Please be a part of the campaign and please help us get that, reach that last $150 or whatever you need to say. Um, highlight somebody that is, you know, donating that you can say, hey, check out my friend Joe Smith. He just contributed $200. Um, somebody that, of course, doesn't mind having that sort of public attention drawn to them, but, you know, stuff like that can be fun. So um, somebody just asked, do you know when the Rocket Hub Fractured Atlas partnership will be in effect? We are working on building the functionality between the two websites right now. We are hoping to launch it in early June. That being said, you know, figure for a little bit more time just based on the way workflow usually happens with software projects, and I would say closer to July, so somewhere between June and July. And we'll have a big announcement about it. Um, somebody else asked, if $70 was the average, do you know what the median contribution is? Um, I don't off the top of my head know the answer to that. But probably if you poked around on their website, you might be able to find, find that out. Um, on the bottom of the slide, I just mentioned that some people find that this is akin to a full-time job. Be prepared. I've definitely heard a lot of people talk about the amount of work that goes into running one of these campaigns. 
it's endless. You know, you have to be on there every day. You have to be sending your receipts and your thank yous. You have to be making sure that you're staying connected to the potential people that could be donating. It's up to you to actually drive people to the site and to make them feel like, make them feel compelled to give. It's not going to happen without you behind the project doing that. Um, and this is sort of my, I always add these sort of obvious slides, but don't forget your manners. Um, don't forget to send that thanks. Even if the websites, which they all offer this, they all offer an automatic receipt that's sent out, you should personally be thanking every single person that donates. That thank you is going to go so far in making them feel compelled to potentially give more. The rate at which people give to these projects online is sort of amazing to look at how many people give more than once. So keep that in mind. While your thank you might not be asking for that second contribution, it will make them pay attention to your campaign. And you know, if, it, if the timing is right for them, they may feel like they're able to give again a second time. Make sure that you know, you're sending um, a card with any perk items, especially for, for larger donors. You never know if you're going to be fundraising for another project down the road. And just a little bit about the crowd, crowdfunding myths. Um, I've already talked about angel donors. Random people will contribute to your campaign. Um, there is no wealthy people who you don't already know spending time on the internet searching for new and interesting ways to spend their money. Um, they just don't exist. I wish they did. It would be amazing for all of our fiscally sponsored projects at Fractured Atlas and all of my friends who are artists if that existed, but it doesn't. Um, you know, it's not easy. It's really hard. So put that time and energy in. Don't launch a campaign before you're about to go on vacation. Don't launch a campaign before you're about to start filming a new project. Don't launch the campaign before you're going on tour for three weeks. It's just not going to be um, easy, and it's going to be incredibly challenging to actually get people involved if you are not involved. Um, post it, and they will come. you got to market this stuff. Otherwise, you're going to be, you have to be prepared to, read, to raise close to nothing. Um, don't ever think that if you build it, they will come. They won't. You need to keep working on it. You need to keep spreading the message. Um, you need to be a member of that online community that you're creating. Make sure you're setting deadlines for yourself so that you can stay on top of when you want you know, things to go out. And make sure you're creating urgency. You don't want to make people panicked, but you do want to make sure that they, that they know that there's a deadline. Um, just don't, don't stop in the middle of the campaign because you're never going to reach your goal if you do that. Diamonds for donors. I already talked about this a little bit, but don't create perks that are too timely or expensive. Um, it's a waste of your time and money. And just remember, huge goals don't necessarily equal huge donations. It's better to be reasonable in your goal setting so that you can actually reach it. So. Um, Crowdfunding is a ton of work. Think about how much time you have personally to commit to it. Um, it's not for everyone. So make sure you evaluate whether or not you think your donors will be compelled to give on it and if it's something they'll be willing to use. Um, it is a great way to raise seed money, and it's a great way to market your work. You're not going to raise millions of dollars, but it's definitely a great way to launch. And um, in case you're not familiar with Fractured Atlas, our phone number is 212-277-8020. You can email us at support, S-U-P-P-O-R-T, at fracturedatlas.org. And, you know, please, if you have questions or you want to talk about anything about crowdfunding, Fractured Atlas is here to help. So it is hard work, but you're not alone. We try to provide you with you know, some support materials, and even just somebody who can listen, because I know that sometimes it's just a matter of talking through what the issues are. So we are here if you need a, if you need a, an ear to talk to or if you just need some suggestions. Um, 
I'm going to answer some of the questions in the chat in one minute, but I just wanted to mention that we also have um, a number of other webinars. We have an introduction to fiscal sponsorship webinar. So if you're not um, in the fiscal sponsorship program and you don't know anything about it, definitely check that one out. It will be the second week of May. The third week of May, we'll have an orientation for new um, projects that have just been accepted into the program. The third, fourth week of May, we'll have the overview of individual donors and online campaigns. That webinar talks a little more specifically about the Fractured Atlas relationship to both Indiegogo and Rocket Hub. And then the, um, I think on May 30th, we're going to be having the proposals, pro proposals and grants for fiscally sponsored projects. Uh, please don't forget our best email address is support at fracturedatlas.org and um, we respond as quickly as we can to emails that are sent to that address. I'm going to answer some of the questions in the chat and also unmute everybody so if you have uh, any questions that you want to ask out loud now is the time to do so um, but if you can't stay on the call thanks so much for calling in and participating. Okay so um, somebody asked, can you give a brief expl explanation to what widget tools might be the most beneficial to use? So the widget tools are just something that you can, you know, grab on the, um, on these websites. You'd have to look a little bit more on their websites. They don't have specific information on those tools. Another person asked, how successful have Fractured Atlas members been on Indiegogo, Kickstarters, Rocket Hub, and others? So our members, you know, have um, been successful using Indiegogo since last July, and we've had a number, we've had about 200 of our fiscally sponsored projects use the Indiegogo platform to raise money, and they've raised um, close to half a million dollars through Indiegogo since the launch of the partnership. I don't have any information on how many Fractured Atlas members have been on Kickstarter, since we don't have a partnership with Kickstarter, there's no way for me to collect this information. Our projects can use Kickstarter to raise money, but the money won't be tax deductible and it has no relationship to the fiscal sponsorship program. Rocket Hub, you know, we just, again, are launching the partnership with Rocket Hub um, in the next few months, so I don't have any numbers on successful projects from there either. But, you know, the crowdfunding is relatively new. And fiscal sponsorship has been around for, you know, over 30 years. And it's something that we're really trying to encourage people to use because there is a lot of success stories out there. And because, you know, there's a lot of social media that goes into the success of these campaigns. Fractured Atlas does have some online campaign functionality on our own website. And our projects have been using that successfully also since we launched that last summer. But, you know, there's, there's not a lot of statistics online um, showing who is raising what through crowdfunding campaigns. You can find um, a, little, a little bit of information, but I've been doing a lot of digging, and it hasn't resulted in that much transparency from the crowdfunding platforms. Um, one thing to keep in mind is all of these crowdfunding platforms are, are for-profit companies. So... You know, they exist to make a profit. They are earning money and, you know, hopefully making some money off of this business that they started. Uh, a major difference between them and Fractured Atlas is that we are a nonprofit. So our fees and all of the funds that, you know, we get out of our programs and services go right back into the, the operation of the company. And we don't have any individuals that privately benefit from, you know, the fiscal sponsorship program. So that's a pretty big difference between us and, and the crowdfunding platforms. But I still, I fully endorse what they're doing and I think that they've, you know, they've created this pretty vibrant and exciting industry for creative projects out there. Does anybody else have any questions? Okay, everyone. Well, Hi, thanks uh, for... Oh. Hi, Craig. Hey, Craig. Hi, this is Craig. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Good. Um, is there a post on Fractured Atlas? Let's say because we're new to social media, 
Uh, finding a social media intern and the questions to ask them. Well, how would you go about interviewing and looking for a social media intern, somebody who's a whiz at this kind of thing? Hmm. We don't have any sort of post on that. Um, but, I mean, I think that ultimately – you just want to find somebody that you can look at a page where they've been responsible for maintaining it. I don't know if there's any other specific questions, but if they can show you, hey, check out what I did for, you know, my my friend's company, um, look at their Facebook page. I think that that's one place to begin. Um, also, just finding out who their contacts are as far as, you know, bloggers and um, just, you know, proven proven results. I think that there are uh, probably a lot of students out there that have experience connecting um, to social media online and know a ton about it. So it's just a matter of being able to make sure that they know what they're doing. So maybe post on some college web, uh, college websites or needed a college intern who's great at social media for a, a deserved project, something like that? Yeah, I mean, if you are if you have any local universities in your area, you might want to connect to some of the art departments, or you know, design departments, graphic design, anybody like that um, might be able to point you in the right direction. Also, you know, of course, there's marketing programs at schools. So if somebody's actually in a business program, they might be interested in focusing on the marketing aspect. So yeah, that'd be a good place to start. We definitely, when we hire at Fractured Atlas. Um, for some of our intern positions, we go to the we go to universities in New York and put posts on their websites because that's you know often where where we find people that are a good fit for us. Okay, good, thanks. No problem. This is Scott Burkholder. Hi, Scott. I had a question with regards to thank you very much. First of all, this was uh, helpful and I appreciate oh. it. Great. Um, I had a question with regards to how much of the fundraising comes from, you know, new people, people who haven't been exposed to your project or um, your organization versus, you know, people who are already there. I imagine, and I know the, the answer to this, but I'm just curious, do you attract a lot of new people through a crowdfunding campaign or is that unrealistic? I mean, what? It, it really depends. You know, there's... Um there are some campaigns where people have told me they knew every single person that donated. They could go through the list and tell you who each person was. There are other campaigns that, you know, they I've been told that they didn't know half the people who contributed. Typically, those campaigns have gotten some sort of press coverage. Um, you know, mostly people being driven from reading an article or a blog post or something that was you know, not directly related to somebody they, they personally know. Um, those seem to be the ones that have strangers going to the websites or going to their campaigns. And is it, I mean, when you, also when you think through, is it, I'm sure, contingent on how you're marketing and um, is it at all related to what you're offering as perks? I mean, what, what are some of the most successful perks in terms of enticing both new people and people who may be aware of you better? You have to remember, I mean, your perks can be really enticing and exciting, but unless people are actually visiting the site, they're not going to know what those perks are. So it's mainly about driving people there. Um, and whether or not it's driving people there through word of mouth or through actual press is kind of up to you and how you manage your, your marketing. I mean, there's it can be a lot of work and... Um, I actually had I, had, I interviewed somebody for an article I wrote about crowdfunding who, um, he raised $80,000 in three months for a project, um, a music project. And he said he hated himself while he was doing it. He said he felt annoying and that he was, um, bombarding everyone he knew and asking them over and over again. He said it made him feel desperate, and he like really disliked it, um, which was the first time I had heard somebody say that. He really felt like there was this pretty nasty dynamic of like, 
you know, like he said he was, he, I think he said he felt like he was shouting all the time in, in, you know, writing to people because it was like he couldn't urge them enough to contribute. And, uh, and he actually, but he got written up in the New York Times. And so it was like when that happened, it was like this moment in time that everything changed. And he said after that, he almost didn't know any of the donors. So it's really, you know, that that was just like a lucky thing that happened to him. He said he wasn't even really reaching out for marketing opportunities. They contacted him. So um, it varies. What kind of, um, you know, media press support does Fractured Atlas provide to their members? We don't really have any sort of media or press support. Um, you know, because we're a national organization, it's, mm -hmm sort of a, a challenging service to provide. And I think that typically, you know, media and press services are, are definitely more on a local basis. So we don't we don't have any um, do services. You, do you announce in the newsletter like campaigns of members that are currently going on or is there is there anything like that? No, we don't do that due to the volume that we deal with. So it's gotcha. um it's really you know it's really about uh, up to you to drive people to those. We also don't have a lot of donors that are looking at our website without being driven there by somebody else. So our newsletter goes out to our members, um, you know, and our members are themselves trying to fundraise, so they're typically not the target audience to be donors. Thank you. No problem. Does anybody else have any questions? Okay, guys. Well, I will send all of you a recording of the presentation, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact us. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thanks Thank a lot. You guys.